glad to see you this morning. We're glad you're here and are joining us. Um, this uh, week has been a very busy week, has it not? And we still need to remember those who have lost loved ones, especially Miss Kay's and Miss family, and also all the ones who have been really uh, bad sick and are still sick. We need to remember those. Keep them in our prayers always. Join us today as we sing about eyes. If you notice that we're doing the parts of the body, we're, we did face for two weeks, and this uh, next few weeks we're going to be doing about the eyes and how God watches us. That's what we're going to be singing about. So join us this morning as we sing. Well, good morning. I'd like to thank you for being here this morning. I'd like to welcome you to our worship services. Um, I just want to go ahead and, and thank you for those of you who have donated candy for our trunk or treat. Uh, there's been a lot of candy donated. And just to give you a numbers update, um, our Facebook post, a lot of you have seen it, liked it, shared it, commented if you have. Um, so far, we've reached 1,250 people. Uh, and we still have a week left. And last year, we reached 2,000 people. And so y'all know the, the crowd we had show up last year. We had over 300 people because someone prepared 300 bags and ran out. And so we had over 300 people lit last, uh, last year. And so we're looking at more people seeing it this year, which means we could have a bigger crowd this year. So if you have a trunk and you're getting your own candy ready, just be, be prepared that we might have a good turnout. So uh, there is more stuff offered this year than last year, but it doesn't matter because most people spend about 10 minutes here, then they hop all over the place. So just be ready. Uh, but for those of you who have donated candy, I want to say thank you for that. I'd also like to thank you for, if you're participating and uh, just gear up, and we're looking forward to that. That'll be this Saturday from 6 to 8. And so please uh, 
be prepared for that. Also, it would be helpful if you could be here and, and set up probably by five or so. Last year, we had people uh, get here early, not our people, people who came to uh, play games and see booths and get candy. They showed up early, and so the earlier we get ready, the earlier uh, we can be ready for them to show up as well. And so if you can be here, please try to have uh, be set up about five or so, or a little before that. Uh, also, I believe they had a good time at the at the pumpkin patch. Brother Toby, I heard you got had a good crowd that went, so I'm glad y'all y'all were able to go. And then also we had a Bible character night this past Wednesday, and there were some angels running around. There was a, a, a few Bible characters running around. So if you participated in that, thank you. Uh, if you if you did participate, I'm sure we'll have some more uh, things like that. But that's what church should be. It should be fun. It should be enjoyable. It shouldn't be um, depressing to come to. It should be enjoyable. Because we're singing, we're coming to learn and to worship our Lord and Savior who died on the cross for us. And so it's glad that you're here. So thankful to see you here this morning. If you would, let's go ahead and bow in prayer. And then after the prayer, if you're in junior church, then you and Brother Toby can, can head that way. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for uh, this day that you've given us. And Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather in your house this morning. And Father, we pray that as we gather and as we assemble here, that we can do everything uh, for your honor and for your glory. Father, we pray that, that we sing songs that glorify you. We pray, Lord, the message is about spreading the, your, your message of, of salvation because that really is the greatest message ever told, the greatest story ever told. It's how you sent your son to die on a cross who didn't deserve the cross but rather took our place on the cross so that we could have a relationship and be made right in your sight and having a fellowship with you once we depart from this world. So, Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus and the sacrifice that he came and paid and, Father, we pray for the one who's never placed their faith and trust in that sacrifice. We pray, Lord, that they would realize their need for you and turn from their sin and face you and submit their lives to you. Father, we pray that this church can follow after you, follow after your, the guiding of your spirit. And, Father, we pray, Lord, that we can do everything we can to build your kingdom and to proclaim the name of Jesus and to make you known. Lord, be with us as we follow you. We also pray, Lord, for the sister churches in our area, Lord, that they also follow after you, preach your message, and build your kingdom. Lord, help us, keep us safe through the remainder of this day. Watch over us, lead God, and direct us as only you can. Forgive us of our many sins, and forgive us where we fail you. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Sister Christy.
just beautiful, just absolutely beautiful. So thank you, Josh, and all of you. On Wednesday nights, we've been started, we just started this past Wednesday, looking at angels. And one verse we looked at was in Revelation. And basically toward the end of the book, after John has seen the letters written to the churches and the bowls poured out and the vials and the beasts and all, he falls down at the angel because in Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 it says God gave the revelation to Jesus, gave it to an angel, signified it by an angel to John. And so the angels given him these, these visions and given him everything that, that he is to write down in Revelation. And after everything, he falls down and he worships the angel. And the angel, the angel tells him, no, don't do that. Worship God. And I almost cried. I'm not, I'm not a teary person, I don't think. But I almost cried during the song because I, I started to imagine that day when we enter glory and we look at that scene where a million, innumerable, countless angels bow down before their creator. Winged beings that are servants outside of our realm that we can't see, that we can't even comprehend. We tried to Wednesday, can't comprehend it. And yet they're going to fall down. And they're going to worship the Lord. And just echo holy. Because that is, I think, the, the primary way you can describe God is holy. And when we start thinking about it, we, I can't think about it, I can't comprehend it because of how holy, righteous He is. And this morning it was a little convicting for me because I understand where our sermon's coming from. And it's coming from Acts chapter 24, 25, and 26. And the reason I did that, in, verse, in chapter 23, it's the same theme throughout chapter 23, but the, there's two different stories. And so we looked at two different stories, but I preached the first part of chapter 23, the second part of 23, and I felt like I was repeating myself. I kind of felt like it was the same sermon. And that's exactly what happens in chapter 24, 25, and 26. Paul stands before Roman officials and governors and, and leaders, and he's on trial still for his innocence. And he stands before them in three chapters over the, the scope of a few years. We read it, we're pretty quick to read it, and we're like, we think it just happened bang, 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 bang. It takes years and years and time and time. And he stands, and all he does is they bring the charges before him, they bring his defense. And then something happens to the case, whether it's disposed of, whether it's appealed, whether it's let go, something happens. And so this is probably the most famous passage in Acts. This is where most of the, the sermons come out of because of the responses of the religious leaders. But we're going to look at this morning, just really Paul, we'll look at his charges, but we'll look at his testimony. But there's something deeper that I want us to uncover this morning. And I stumbled upon this story. I don't know who wrote it. There's no author here. But it says, an old man walking the, uh, the beach at dawn noticed a young man ahead of him picking up starfish and flinging them into the sea. Catching up with the youth, he asked what he was doing. The, ans uh, the answer th was that the, st the stranded starfish would die if left until the morning sun. But the beach goes on for miles and there are millions of starfish, counted the old man. How can your effort make a difference? The young man looked at the starfish in his hand and then threw it to safety in the waves. It makes a difference to this one, he said. There is a principle, actually there's a few principles in the life of the believer. And we talk about them, right? We talk about prayer. We talk about reading your Bible. We talk about coming to church. We talk about giving. We talk about being generous. We talk about uh, being kind. There's one principle that we really don't do a whole lot. And that's evangelism. We just don't. And it's you know, my, pro my problem, my fault, your fault. I mean, we, we just don't do it. And we look through Paul and the life of the missionary Paul, and we see him, and that's all he does, it seems. I don't, I don't know when he has time to build tents because he's so busy witnessing, witnessing and ministering to the churches that he's, he's at. It seems like he's always evangelizing. Let me turn my mic on. And now I look at my own life, and I'm not. Right? I don't. 
And sometimes we get to thinking about it and we're like, well, why would we? Why should we? The, the world has billions of people. And it's so vast. It's so, so expansive. And you know the, the root of the problem? Is we're not called to be evangelists to the billions of people. We're just called to be an evangelist. We're just called to witness. And by us walking down this beach, taking this starfish and throwing it back into the sea, you know what we're doing? We're taking a soul, a human, a person, off of the hot beach where they could potentially die and perish, and we're throwing them into the waves of glory. It's literally what we're doing. And yes, the beach is miles long, and yes, there's all kinds of starfish, but that doesn't really matter. That's why we come to church. That's why we use our church. That's why we have missionaries. Because together, we can accomplish that. But the thing is, we have to be evangelistic. And that means taking every opportunity presented to us for the opportunity to share Jesus with somebody. And that's what we see Paul do. We'll begin in verse, in chapter 24. we we'll really focus probably on chapter 26. But chapter 24, let's first notice what happens. So if you remember, he left off chapter 23. He's just kind of sitting there waiting for his accusers to come and bring his charges against him. And that's where we pick up in 24.1. He says, Now after the five days, Ananias the high priest came down from, uh, with the elders and a certain orator uh, named Totelus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And so it was a very common thing to do. High priests didn't like their charges to just get away. And so they would bring an orator that would come and make this grand speech, try to persuade the, the judge, but also try to make their charges seem rather uh, heavy. And so he brings this order with him, and we're going to charge Paul before the governor. And so he was called upon. He began his, uh, his, accus uh, his uh, accusation, and here's what he says. Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, ne not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy... A few words from us. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. So there are the, the, the problems. There are the charges. First off, he's a troublemaker. He's just a pest. He's just this, this plague. Really, he's a bother just being alive. He's a pest. But fifth, uh, in verse 5, it says that he's also a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world. Basically, what they have claimed Paul does is he comes into this town and he just creates riots. He creates uh, fights between Jews and they become riots and they just keep going and going. So he, he basically starts these insurrections. It's a terrible thing to do. It said in verse Five, that he's also a ringleader, or he's basically the leader of these Nazarenes. And then another charge in verse 6 is he tried to profane the temple, and we seized him. So basically he wanted to desecrate the temple, he wanted to ruin it, he wanted to destroy it, to, to dirty it up, and we seized him. And so Paul begins his defense before Felix. And it's interesting, if you notice back in verse 2 and 3, we know these people. You know those people that come to, come to work, and maybe your boss isn't the best boss, but they say he is? Felix was not a good leader. He was more of a slave who just became a governor. He was not a good ruler. He liked cruelty. He was a terrible person. But this orator comes, and he basically says uh, in verse 2, We enjoy great peace and prosperity is being, uh, is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. You know what he does? He's earning brownie points, right? That's what we call them. Basically, he's just wanting to get on, the, on Felix's good side and say, here's the problem with Paul. He's just a, a, a riotous person. He's just a pest. He's a plague, and he tried to desecrate our temple. And so we tried to lay holds on him, but your guards got in the way. Your soldiers got in the way. And so Paul begins his defense, and then notice, we've already seen his testimony. We see what happens. Uh, look down at verse 22. When Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lysias the commander comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to, uh, to provide for or visit him. 
And after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left bound. Interesting what happened. Simply because of Paul's little defense, the case is dismissed. And he says, whenever the Roman, whenever the, 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 the centurion, the commander comes, then we'll deal with your case and we'll find out what the problem is. But for several years, Felix sends for Paul and talks to him about Christianity. And when that happens, he begins to talk about righteousness in verse 25. He begins talking about self-control. He begins talking about the judgment to come. And Felix, in verse 25, was afraid. But his response is, terrifies me. He says, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. It wasn't convenient at the time for Felix to depend on Christ. It wasn't convenient at the time for him to hear about Christianity. And so when it was a more convenient time, Paul, I'm going to call back for you and we'll figure this out. But do you see what happened and how quick that turned? Verse 27, after two years, Festus succeeded Felix. So Felix is out of the picture now and Festus now comes on the scene for two years. What if Felix had said, in three years I'll call for you. It'll be a more convenient time in three years. In two years it was up. There's a danger with waiting for a more convenient time. There's a danger in waiting for it to be convenient for your lifestyle. Sometimes we'll say, Lord, I'll do it your way, but at a more convenient time. Maybe when the kids are grown. Maybe when I'm retired. Maybe when uh, I finally get my promotion. We wait for a more convenient time, and we just keep putting it off, and putting it off, and putting it off. And we're thinking, oh, we have plenty of years in our life, and then we're at our funeral the next day. We don't know. But we're waiting for a more convenient time. Maybe when there's not many people here at church. Maybe when there's a different preacher. Maybe when Sunday school lesson goes a little bit better. We're waiting for a more convenient time. And really what we're just doing is pushing it back, pushing it back. And what could happen one day, and what will happen one day, you'll die. And if you keep placing it and pushing it and pushing it back, that convenient time no longer becomes convenient. It becomes too late. And so be careful if you're under conviction. Be careful if you know that Jesus needs to be your Savior. Be careful waiting for a more convenient time. So Festus comes in, in verse, 20, uh, verse 1 of chapter 25. Festus had come down to the province. After three days he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him. So Festus comes on. After three days he goes to Jerusalem, and guess what's waiting for him? The high priest. The high priest says, hey, you have a prisoner. He needs to be put to death. He, he's not fit to live. We need him taken care of. And so three days... And so Festus goes and he hears him. But in verse 13, notice who comes to town. After some days, King Agrippa and Bernice come to, uh, came to Caesarea to meet Festus. So King Agrippa and his sister Bernice come. And if you remember Herod earlier in the Bible, this would be, I think, the grandson of Herod. This is Agrippa II, the last Herod to rule. He comes and he's basically coming to greet the new governor, Festus. And so he gets there and Festus says in uh, verse 14... When there had been many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem asking for a judgment against him. And so Festus basically lays out what's going on before Agrippa. But the problem is that Paul has appealed to Caesar. And so if you go down to verse 26... He says, I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have brought him out before you, 
and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. And so he wants to write a letter to, to Caesar and send Paul on his way, but he's not sure what to write. He's not sure the charges. He's not sure they're even, even liable. He's not, not sure they're, they're, they're holding any water. And so he wants King Agrippa to hear about, about Paul. So in verse 1 of chapter 26, Agrippa says to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our twelve tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun shining around me, and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and have an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, verse 19, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Paul gives a pretty remarkable thing, and all he does is really tell his testimony. He says, these same accusers who stand before you accusing me today, I was one of those. I was just like them. I had the authority of the chief priests. They gave me letters. I went to foreign cities. I went to, to local cities. And what I did, I took them bound. I took them and we killed them. And I voted against them when we killed them. And yet here I am standing because Jesus intervened in my life. He says, and when Jesus intervened, I understood who it was. We had a conversation. And he told me that I was to go to preach to the Jew and the Gentile that Jesus Christ, you know what he does, sets you free. In essence, that's what Jesus does. He sets you free from the bondage of sin. He sets you free from the bondage of your past life. He sets you free, and he gives you freedom. And so after this, in verse 24, he made his defense. Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escape his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. 
Now, King Agrippa was very familiar with Jewish customs and manners, so he was very familiar with what Paul was talking about. And so Paul has just stood very, very, very briefly and quickly. We've just sped up a few years in a matter of about 10 minutes. What he's done is he now stands before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. And you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't stand before him and he says, I'm innocent, let me go. He doesn't say, I've never done anything wrong here, I'm not worthy of being here. No, instead what he says is, here's my testimony. Here's what I've done, here's what I'm accused of, but here's what God told me to do. And if you hear in the last part of verses 19 through 23, he actually tells Agrippa and Festus the gospel. And I think if I had been in this situation, I would be trying my hardest to convince them I was innocent. And I think most of us would do the same, right? You're standing before a governor, a judge, and here you are with false accusations and rumors, and they're bringing these charges against you. You're not worried about Jesus. If we're being honest, you're not worried about the salvation that can be offered to the judge. You're worried about your innocence and your freedom. I know because I am too. And yet Paul stands, he says, I understand I'm accused. I understand what's going on. But here's the truth. Jesus saved me. And the same Jesus that I was told to go preach repentance and from, uh, to the Jews and repentance to the Gentiles, that same repentance is available to you. He doesn't really care about his freedom, it doesn't seem. He doesn't seem these are ridiculous charges. He says, here's Jesus. And he just puts Jesus before them. And do you know we've had three different reactions? The first one said, come back at a more convenient time. The second one, verse 24, says, you're crazy. You're beside yourself. You're mad. And then the third one, in verse 28, King Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. That's actually a compliment to Paul's preaching ability. He says, we've had a short time together and you've almost persuaded me to be a Christian. But I don't have a recollection. I don't see where Agrippa actually falls to his knees and says, you're right, Paul, I need Jesus. And so what we look at is typically those responses, right? We look at, well, someone may want a more convenient time. You're right, someone might. Someone might say, I'm crazy. You're right, they might. And actually, they probably will. Someone could say, oh, you almost persuaded me, but didn't. But in our culture, what we really do is have this idea of negativity, right? If you ask someone if this will work, oh, it probably won't work. It's just, just the way it is. Instead of saying, how can I find a way for this to work? It's, no, it won't ever work. Well, it might, but we're just so negative, and we're negative about a lot of things. And so when we come to evangelism, we come to evangelism with this idea of negativity, saying, what if I go to them and they don't believe it? Or better yet, what if I go to them and they think I'm crazy? Or better yet, what if I go to them and they say no? Yet that's not what we're called to do. We're not called to open their heart, to place the, the Bible inside, to close it, to make them get saved and make them get baptized and make them come. That's not what we're called to do. All we're called to do is exactly what Paul has done and said, in every opportunity, you take Jesus and what you know about him and you place it before them. And their decision is no longer on you, it's on them. But your responsibility is to place it before them. Not your freedom or your innocence, or maybe your intelligence, but Jesus. I'm very glad we sang the song. One of my favorite songs is we sang the, the Go, Light Your, Go Light Your World. I've sang that song a lot of times by myself. I love that song. And in essence, that is what the believer is to do. Because what Jesus does is he shines a light in the darkness. Guess what I was? I was dark. But you know what Jesus has done? He's lit me up. He lit my candle. I now have a flame. And in return, what I am to do is take my flame, take my light, and just go light the world. If their candle doesn't light, it's not my fault. I'm not called to light their candle. I'm called to try. If they don't light their candle, that's on them. 
But it's on me if I don't give them the ability to light their candle. And so we look at evangelism and we're like, what if they think I'm crazy? What if they mock me on Facebook? Who cares? Because here's the truth. One day we'll stand in eternity with the angels and we will echo holy. And we'll bow before our Creator, our Lord, our God, and we'll echo holy. And I want as many people to be there. And it's not on me to get them there. It's on me to make sure that they at least have an opportunity to get there. How amazing would it be if your family one day stands in the presence of Almighty God beside you and just worships the Lord? All because you loved them enough to go to them, say, I love you. Have you heard about Jesus? Sometimes I don't think we take it as seriously as we need to. Because I know I don't take it as serious as I need to. I go through Acts and I see Paul stoned, accused, arrested, beaten. He'll be shipwrecked here. I'll spoil the end. He'll be shipwrecked here in a second. And I say, I don't count it as important as Paul did. And it's because I get so worried about myself. I get worried of what people think about me. I get worried of what my Facebook posts, how many likes I get. I get worried about everything that's going on inside of me and around me. And I forget that one day it's not going to matter. That negative Facebook post about you is not going to be there anymore. Facebook won't be there anymore. A lot of us are saying hallelujah. That's the wrong hallelujah. Hallelujah is that we will stand before Almighty God and we have an opportunity to impact the world not with the next big company, not with the next big idea, with the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ alone. That is where the hallelujah goes. Because God has instilled upon us this purpose, this job, to take your candle, to take your testimony. It doesn't have to be the whole Bible. Just what God has done for you. And you take it, and you spread it to the lost world. I found another story. I need to start finding the authors. I can't find them. It says, In the spring of 1992, fourth grade students in Portland, Maine, carried out a novel experiment. Their teacher, Pamela Triou, was teaching the kids about the ocean, specifically about the Gulf Stream that uh, flows along the East Coast and then turns toward Europe. According to uh, Reuters, she had the kids put messages with their address in empty wine bottles, and then a fisherman took the 21 bottles away from shore and threw them into the ocean. They hoped that some of the bottles might drift to England. Three months later, two bottles washed up in Canada. The class heard nothing else and assumed that the rest of the bottles were lost at sea. Two years passed. Then one of the students, George, uh, Je Jeff Height, received a surprise letter from a girl in France. She found one of their bottles while walking with her father on the beach. It says, our efforts at evangelism are often like tossing a bottle with a message into the ocean. We share the gospel with others however we can, giving them a piece of literature, a track, a personal testimony, a prayer with someone in need. We see no response and think our message is forgotten, lost at sea. But years later, we learn that the Spirit of God, like the mighty Gulf Stream, has carried our message to its destination. And that's what we have to remember. The Lord is not calling on us to act as the Holy Spirit to convict other people of their lost souls. The Holy Spirit, is that's His job. All He wants us to do is use our ability to write our message in a bottle and let the Holy Spirit take it to the heart that it needs to go to. If they respond with, that's crazy, you almost had me, or maybe later, that's on them. But to be Paul, to be witnesses, to be light, to be a candle, we have to at least use our opportunity to share that message. And that's the question I have for you this morning. How well are you doing at being a billboard for Jesus? How well are you at putting Jesus on display in your life for everyone around you to see it? But then the question also becomes is, when someone tells you about Jesus, how do you respond? Maybe, if you're sitting here this morning, maybe you start looking through the hymnal and looking at all the books or 
Maybe you start drawing on the little greener or orange piece of paper in front of you, or maybe you're playing on your phone. And so you're, you're saying to Jesus, not today. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm, I need a Savior. I know I need you in my life, but not today. What happens if you wait too long? Then one day, instead of singing with the teenagers, who did a great job, by the way, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, you'll be in another place, a much worse place, thinking maybe back to this day, how you had the opportunity, but when Jesus convicted you, you said, no way, not today. See, the truth is, Jesus came, he lived, he died on a cross, on a tree, forsaken, hated, yet loving you. And he did that with a sole purpose to pay the price for your sin so that you could have a relationship with him this morning. You see, Jesus loves you. And he knows some of you will say, not today, or you almost had me. Or... But he also knows some of you will say, Lord, I need you. And that's why he did it. Because he loved you enough that he wanted you to have a relationship with him. So he came and paid the price for your sin. And now he stands this morning with an invitation. Saying, we're going to come and the church is going to sing a song and we're all going to stand up. And at that time is what we call an invitation. Because we believe when the word of God is preached, is opened, is spoken, there should be a response. Whether in our lives outwardly or whether in our hearts inwardly. And that's what the invitation is. It's a time for you to respond. It's a time for the person who says, maybe later, can respond to the word of God and say, you know what, now's the time. Or it's a time for our church to say, I've not been a very good evangelist. I haven't been a good, very good witness. I need to be. So Lord, forgive me of that. Change me and make me a better evangelist. That's my prayer this morning is that he makes me a better evangelist, a better witness, a better preacher. What's the Lord want you to do this morning? Is it to respond to him or is it to go and testify with a megaphone as a billboard that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life? What is it this morning? Would you bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. And Father, we look at the example of Paul and as he's standing before death, before accusation, before governors, Lord, we pray that we can follow his example. That as we stand, whether it's in our schools or our jobs or our businesses, Father, as we stand, that we would proclaim your greatness, your mercy, your grace, but most importantly, Lord, your salvation. That we would take Jesus and what he's done to us and offer that, extend that to someone else. So with the hope, Father, that your spirit could take it, could convict them of their sin, their need for you, and turn them into a believer. Father, we pray, Lord, for the one here today, maybe, that's lost that knows Jesus died on the cross for them but has never made that decision. Father, we pray that during this invitation, during this time of response, they would make that decision to place their faith, their trust in you, and submit their lives to you to follow after you and your ways. Father, we pray, Lord, that if we're not, not the evangelists and the witnesses or the witness, uh, witnesses we need to be, Father, we pray that you would help us to be better. Father, we pray everything is done here is for your honor and for your glory. Be with us and be with those that need to respond. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.